Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Our next guest had his life turned upside down when he experienced a supernatural encounter with a nine-year-old, nonverbal, autistic boy named Josiah Cullen. He tells the story of his unique long-distance friendship with young Josiah and his family and how someone can undeniably know that Jesus is real and fully present, even when feelings and circumstances scream the opposite. Josiah, who hails from Minnesota, had prophetic visions and messages from God about our next guest, who lived in Louisiana. And even though the two had never met or had any contact, these compelling prophetic messages, which Josiah typed with one finger and emailed to him, were packed with amazing biblical insight and highly detailed specifics about our next guest's life, including his personal prayer life, details that Josiah could not possibly have known unless they were revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Max Davis is the author of over 30 books. In addition to his own works, he's done numerous collaborations with highly notable leaders. Max's books have been featured in USA Today, Publishers Weekly, Southern Living, and Bible Gateway, as well as on the Today Show and the 700 Club. He holds degrees in journalism and theology and is a faith-energizing speaker for churches and organizations. God is using Max's hope-infused stories combined with journalistic research and solid biblical teaching to challenge unbelievers, encourage those struggling in their, in their faith, and spark prayer revivals in hearts around the world. Joining us now to share the amazing story of Jesus, Josiah, and me, how my supernatural encounter with an autistic boy revealed the wonder of God's presence. Welcome into the show, Max Davis. Hey, Rabbi, I'm glad to be here. I'm just humble. Every time I hear somebody read that or talk about it, it's just very humbling, and uh, I'm grateful. Ma so. Max, this has got to be, um, I tell you that uh, uh, we're in our fifth season. We've aired over 2,000 shows. I've read over the, all, all, all 2,000 books that I've interviewed, and uh this was by far, and I, I say this not to disparage any of the incredible guests that we've had on this program, but this is one of the most amazing chronicles of a move of God's Spirit in more than a supernatural way. And I'm not a sensationalist. I, I don't believe in sensationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the signs and wonders and manifestations I hear about um, always have kind of a jaundiced eye towards. Yeah. But as you chronicled this story, it was so moving, so compelling, mm -hmm. so amazing at every possible level that I read cover to cover, including the invitation to accept Messiah at the end, that made it so that this was exactly what Josiah wanted it to be. Mm. His desire, nonverbal, not able to speak in a world that was almost a prison to him, mm. a world he couldn't process, but yet he was so tuned in to the Spirit of God and somehow amazingly connected with you over a thousand miles away, revealing things that only God knew, mm. secrets of your heart mm. that, that were you are familiar with, but not as well known to you until it was revealed to you by Josiah mm. Mm. in words that framed it in a way that you had never framed it before that was so spot on that it changed your own vernacular and your own self-description. This is a transformation that is chronicled that is nothing short of miraculous. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, what, what makes the story somewhat, well, the story is just incredibly unique, and I'm going to tell you some things, but you need to know a little bit about me. I'm a journalist, okay? I have a degree in journalism from University of Mississippi and a degree in Bible, and I've combined the two. 
But I was a very skeptical journalist. I'm, I'm just like you. I hate exaggeration. I hate embellishment. Um, I, wrote, I wrote a book called uh, The Insanity of Unbelief, uh, a journalist's journey from skepticism to belief to deep faith. And it was actually a number one. It hit number one. But this story is not subjective. See, that, that's the thing. Like, if someone sees an angel or has an out-of-body experience or a near-death experience, those are powerful and they're very real, but they're subjective. You can still say, well, you know, that person, whatever. This story is not subjective. I have facts that back up. This is what the boy said 1,200 miles away. This is what I did. And there's only one way he could know that, and that's through the Holy Spirit. And, and I tell any atheist, we've had atheists, I've had hardcore atheists, lives changed through this book. And, but what I tell an atheist at the end of the story, I'm not telling you what to believe. You can believe whatever you want, but these are the facts. And, and to me, it, it proves that God is real, he's alive, and he's fully present. Um, I, you know, at the end of the story, an atheist has to say, either God is real or I'm a liar. Or anybody that reads the story, but the, but but I'm not a liar because I have the facts to to back it up. So basically, what this book is, we're just telling the story and letting the Holy Spirit do the rest. And but it's not subjective. It's not subjective at all. And that's what makes us a little different. Um. So and as a journalist, I've interviewed and researched authentic miracles all over the world. So I can tell you, there are authentic miracles happening all the time, you know, right now. And this is one of them. So, Max, the, the whole experience of this was... Take us to the genesis of uh, the phone call, the, the, the mm -hmm. conversation with, with another author that you've had conversations with before. Uh, there was nothing really unusual about the conversation. Right. Uh, you have friends that are authors you and journalists and you, you regularly speak to them on occasion about projects and you were in the middle of a renovation of your home. Yes. You yeah. were completely displaced from this, this uh, Hemingway-esque uh, little uh, space that you had carved out for yourself like Hemingway right. did that right. that and and uh, you found that that mot motels not hotels but motels <laughs> uh, uh, be, be became a kind of a haven for your your writing you were living out of a, 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 a mobile home while your home was being renovated and actually old farm t farmhouse torn down and and changed and this this was known to you and to your family and to your friends but uh, to a non-communicative autistic child that who had no no access to the internet by the way so couldn't have read about it couldn't have heard about it no one could have explained it to them right. the, the details are uncanny so kind of take us to the genesis and then how all this came about and very specific words, phrases, uh, pictures, because I'm a Hebrew guy. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I get what he was saying and it's, it's, it's beyond my explanation mm -hmm. other than a supernatural move of God. Let me just tell you briefly how it started and then I'm going to give you a couple of supernatural <laughs> words that he gave me that just are going to blow you away. And so, so the way it happened, and, and this gets into the details, because I wrote this book like a journalist, where I detail things that come into play in the end. But uh, in, I received from, from January of 2015 to October of 2018, I received over 20 pages of prophetic words from Josiah, like you said, typed with his one finger, <laughs> into an iPad or a, a laminated cardboard um, keypad. And he would type one finger, one word, 
And then his mother, you know, writes it out. And then she is responsible for getting the message to me. And by the way, the, for the super skeptic, and you got to understand, I was so skeptical in the beginning that I made his mother cry. Her name is Tani. And, um, but these are things that the mother couldn't have known either. So, so if somebody would say, oh, the mom is manipulating. No, no, no. She didn't know any of this stuff either. So, but, but the way it started was in January 2015, I made a phone call to an author friend of mine in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. And she had written a book that really blessed me. And so I just called her. And I'm in Louisiana, in Baton Rouge, walking around the park, talking to her on the phone. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning. And we're just having this conversation about um, this book that she wrote. And, 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 of course, I have an agent. And anyway, she, she and we were talking about that and the different uh, aspects of writing and um, the business, the writing business. And she just told me, she said, I have a friend who has an autistic boy. I have a friend, Tony Cullen, who has an autistic boy, Josiah Cullen, who gets these prophetic messages from God. And we just talked about that for a few minutes. And then we hung up. I mean, she didn't ask me for anything. It wasn't like, you know, she needed anything from me. Well, so I went about my business. Well, at about 11 o'clock, she called Tani and told Tani, I, I had a, you know, a conversation with, with this interesting author today. His name is Max Davis, blah, blah, blah. So that was about 11 o'clock. Again, nothing was asked of me. It was just information. So that was about 11 o'clock. Josiah is at, at his school uh, for autistic boys, and he comes home at about 3 o'clock that afternoon. Never spoke to Tani. They had no interaction. He started typing a message to her. And during that message, Tani, he's, he's typing the message, and Tani notices and says, you're talking about a person. She noticed he was talking about a person. And Tani goes, does this have anything to do with Max? So all she, all she gave him was my first name. He didn't even get my last name. He's had no interaction with, him, with her. And immediately he types, lots to do with Max. He's not only a major novel writer, but he knows valuable sameness is not, the, um, uh, is not always the best approach. And then he goes on with this long message just in the book. But his first, like he knew I was an author. He knew I was a novel writer. And what's interesting is I was at that time, I was finishing, I was on a major deadline for a novel with a major publisher. And I had just written a novel with a major publisher. Um, so, so he knew right off the bat that I was not just a writer, but I was a novel writer. And most of my books are, are nonfiction, but occasionally I write, write a novel, and he knew that. And so immediately I'm thinking, oh, Tiny must have told him, because I could have been anybody. Who is Max? Max could have been a preacher or a teacher or a football coach, but for him to know I was a novel writer, um, that just blew me out the water. Well, well, Tiny got that message and contacted my friend that I had talked to on the phone and got my email, and she sent it to me. Well, immediately, you know, I, I started drilling um, Tiny, Josiah's mom, like, you had to know something. You had to go to my website. There's no way he would know that. And she just assured me um, that she had no contact with him, and he just started typing that message. And so from the very beginning, he knew that. Well, you know, that, that was pretty amazing in itself, but, you know, it's, but it, that was the beginning of the 20 pages of words over the next two years that changed my life. And that's how she got my email. So what would happen is Tony would, uh, Josiah would have these spontaneous words for me, would type them out, and Tony would send them to me. And you talked about Hebrew. Um, Josiah's words are filled with Hebrew and I asked her I said w where did he learn Hebrew and he says I have we, she said we've never even exposed him to Hebrew but he had Hebrew words and, she, and she, Josiah said well Jesus and the angels taught me <laughs> and for example 
uh, in his first word to me, he said, Tani is my dialect, my dialect, D-E-L-E-T, is that the way? It's my dialect. Yeah. He kept saying, Tani is my dialect. Well, that's the Hebrew word for doorway. And what he was saying that his mom is the doorway. He types the messages, but she sends them out. She's the doorway. She's the key to this thing happening. Um, and, and he used a Hebrew word that, that he had never been exposed to. And his words were filled with that. You know, the breath of Ruach, um, uh, several other Hebrew words like that. Let's take but, a um, moment. I want, I want to take a moment and make sure the audience understands. <clears throat> Josiah is, a, uh, for the first two years of his life, normally developing a young boy. He says, Mama, Dada, Banana, everything's rocking along fine. And then all of a sudden, at about age three, he goes into this new world. And right. he curls up and he's non-communicative, uh, prone to... Uh, Outbursts, verbal outbursts, difficult to manage. This becomes a 24-7 type yes. of, of caregiving that his mother is involved in. He is on the spectrum. He is low functioning on yes. the autism spectrum. Therefore, the expectation was is he would not be able to communicate. Right. And uh, what his mother did was taught him by pointing to letters, trying to, to teach him, not giving yes. up on the fact that there was some way to reach him. And it was through this pointing to letters that yes. he began to mimic. And yes. in this mimicking, he was able to then point to a letter. And uh, all, it started out on a, on a laminated type of keyboard corresponding to a computer keyboard. Then they bought him a tablet where he could do it himself, but it was a very laborious practice. Oh. It, was, it, was not, it was not something that was rapid. It was no. one very deliberate, slow, because you bore witness to this, because yes. ultimately you visited them. But I want to paint the picture that this is not a high functioning. This is not no. one that in the natural would demonstrate any capability for comprehension, right. any ability for communication, any ability for the mastery of technology, mm -hmm. none of that. Totally incapable of it and was, was functioning at what you would expect. A violent outburst, screaming fits, rocking, all of those things, spinning a wheel over and over and over again, mm -hmm. flipping a light switch for, mm -hmm. for, for an hour, uh, mm -hmm. in, engaged in those things that on the low end of the autism spectrum, this young, young, young boy, eventually a teenager, uh, fully growing into a man's body, but having this, mm -hmm. this prison that he's yes. in. And so there's, there, there's nothing to indicate that he has any capacity to intelligently process cohesive sentences and the expression of thought. Yes. Yet, in his communication with you, it was crystal clear. It, it's just amazing. And a lot of this I'm giving you a, a, giving it away a little bit. You have to read the book. But after two years and getting 20 pages, I decided I needed to fly up there and meet him in person. <laughs> and, I mean, you would have thought I was going to, to meet the president of the United States. I'm going to meet this autistic boy that changed my life. And what you have to understand, again, he's in Minnesota. I'm in Louisiana. We've never met other than that initial phone call, and we still didn't meet. And he has 20 pages of, of amazing words for me. I fly up there. This boy is so locked up. When I mean locked up, he, he can't even turn the page on a book. I mean, he is so, his muscles, his mind is just non-functioning. Um, you know, he's still in diapers. I mean, right now he's 15, I think, or 16. He's still wearing diapers. So... It's it's just, it, it visiting him in person made the supernatural 
element even more supernatural. I mean, he typed one. I was sitting in his room, and his mama said, um, "Would you like to type a message to Max?" And he typed one sentence, one sentence, and it took five minutes. I mean, Tiny just laboring with him, and I noticed that that she she never forced him to do anything. She would Josiah would type a letter. She would call out the letter and then say, would you like to continue? And he would be like, ah, ah, and she would say, Joe, do you want to continue? And then he would say, yeah, and he would type another letter. And this went on for, you know, three, four, five minutes just to type one sentence. So you can imagine the, the labor it took for him to type me 20 pages. And, and Tani, you know, this is not something she did because she wanted to. <laughs> It was a labor of love and obedience. Um, when she sent the first message to me, she was so nervous because she didn't even think I, I wrote novels. And so she was scared, you know. But anyway, over 20, 20, 20 pages in, in uh, what's that, three years? Two years, three years, yeah, three years. Uh, what, what, can what? I tell you one story? Sure. Or do you want to say something? No, I just want to uh, uh, just say that uh, uh, the gifts you brought him were all LSU gifts. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. That was uh, something that he commented on yes. that you could have sent them to him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. He said, he said, sending them to me would be nice, but, but you, I forget the word, it was some autistic word, but you wittily got on a plane and flew flew up here to give them to me you know um it's pretty amazing i like to tell this one story that kind of kind of illustrates the whole book and how supernatural it is and how sovereign his words were um you mentioned we were building a house we, we have 40 acres of land and we we're actually building a new house we told tore the old house down completely and we're building a new house and we lived in a little camp-like trailer in the woods next to to the house. And I'm a prayer. I'm a prayer man. I've been praying for years. Prayer is kind of the center of my life. And one of the things about Josiah's words were every place I went and prayed, I got a word from God. And so. Uh, during this time, because we were building a house, I didn't have an office to pray in anymore. And in the camper trailer, I didn't have an office. So I was going to all these different places to pray. And one night, this was February of 20, uh, February of 2015. It was about 45 degrees. And I decided I was going to go in the woods and spend the night in prayer, crying out to God. Now, what you have to understand, and this is very critical, I had never done this before. I had never prayed in those woods at night before. Uh, there was no electricity. I mean, we're talking completely dark back there. And I mean, I went way back in the middle of the woods, and I just began crying out to God. I mean, it was just for two hours, I just cried out to God, and I worshiped Him. And I remember I had these two trees, that I walked around in circles, and I just was crying out to God, worshiping Him, laughing. It, we just, me and God just had this incredible time. And after about two hours of praying, we had like a little um, shed in the back of the woods with a swing on it. And there was no electricity. You gotta understand, there was no electricity. So it was completely dark, kind of like a deer stand in the middle of the woods. And so there's this little shed in the woods with, with a swing on it. And after about two hours of prayer, the Spirit of God just fell on me. And I sat in that swing. Now, what you have to understand, I'm sitting in this swing, and I am literally basking in the presence of God. I just, I'm sure you felt it before, but I just felt His warm oil pouring over me. And, and it was like Jesus was sitting right there. And I'm just, I got my hands open, I'm swinging back and forth, and I'm just like, Jesus, it just, it was just such an amazing encounter. And I remember laying down like this, 
on that swing, and just basking in the presence of Jesus. It was a physical manifestation of his presence. I mean, I knew he was in my heart. He's always in my heart. It's not about feelings. He's always present, whether we feel him or not. But this time, it was a physical manifestation of his presence. And it was so incredible. And eventually the presence left. And, and I got up and, and I went back home. And it was in the morning. Well, early, the next morning I got up. And I had a message from Josiah. Just a sovereign message. And this is what it said. It said, might big nights be turned to your advantage? You sat in the freedom of Jesus for a very great night time. In the very nice woods, you made an altar for him there, and Jesus felt a very big hello uh, from your view. Now, what I like to ask people is, I mean, how many people do you know sit in the freedom of Jesus in the middle of the woods at night? And, and, and that was a sovereign message. You know, it wasn't prompted by anything. In fact, I, don't, I had not heard from Josiah. Uh, the last time I'd heard from him was the beginning of January. So what that did for me is it just let me know that Jesus sees us. He sees us. He is really present. And he used an autistic boy to show me that. And and that's one of the you know the examples of the stories. They're just I mean you can't deny them. You know I mean what are the odds of that? You know, I had never prayed in the woods before. I prayed in the middle of the night. I sat in the freedom of Jesus. That's the best way. Like you were talking about the words. That's the best way to describe it. Just sat in the freedom of Jesus in the middle of the woods in the middle of the night. And then the next morning to get a sovereign message. From Josiah. That's what's interesting about these words is we never prompted him for anything. So it's, and, and it's to just a skeptic a, or an unbeliever, I would say, you know, what do you do with that? And then you have 20, 23 words like that. You know, every place I pray. It's an amazing story. We're talking with Max Davis, author of Jesus, Josiah, and Me, How My Supernatural Encounter with an Autistic Boy Revealed the Wonder of God's Presence. Can you imagine someone 1,200 miles away, unable to communicate in the natural, who has a direct pipeline to the throne of grace, mm. who hears from Jesus and the angels to teach him how to communicate mm. with Max. A specific word for a specific time with a specific message. And the message wasn't always in retrospect as to what Max was doing. There were also prophetic in, in indications of what, what Max would be doing and what was to be doing. Mm as he was giving a prophetic word for the future. How is this possible? A child who cannot commute with his own, communicate with his own mother and father can eloquently write in beautiful prose that can only come from heaven and send it to a total stranger 1,200 miles away and to know that it's verifiable, it's true, and it continued over several years. And not one of the words was inaccurate, did not apply, or was random. Many more stories like this that we're going to explore on the other side of this break. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, host of Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Revealing Prophecy, seen every week on the Igniting Nation Broadcasting Network. Our daily on-demand programming is available on our Apple and Android apps, and on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Android TV. We broadcast live Monday through Friday through our apps, 
on our website, IgnitingNation.com, and on Facebook Live. You can listen daily on our audio platforms on Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn, and iHeart. Our lineup of best-selling authors bring you the most in-depth biblical insights into the most pressing issues of our time, including prophecy, Israel, spiritual warfare, and a wide variety of contemporary Christian issues impacting the body of Messiah around the globe. If you missed the live show, you can always catch up on the Igniting Nation YouTube channel. Follow us on social media and join us as we endeavor to heal the nations with the Word of God. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to study right by my side through the Biblical Truth Library. Imagine having access to over 1,000 hours of audio and video teachings available to you through our website on a subscription basis or via our Apple and Android apps on an a la carte basis. Whichever method you choose, we promise to deliver new insights into the living Word of God as seen through the eyes of a Jewish believer. If you hunger and thirst like millions around the world for a deeper walk with God and the revelation of new understanding of the Scriptures, visit IgnitingAnation.com and click on the Biblical Truth Library or on any device with our free app. Don't let another day go by without receiving your heart's desire for a new depth of understanding into all of God's Word. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and my special featured guest twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops, and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black for in-depth insights into Israel, prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Kanan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitingandnation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out, and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Max Davis, author of Jesus, Josiah, and Me, how my supernatural encounter with an autistic boy revealed the wonder of God's presence. Max, welcome back. Good to be here. You know, Max, none of us feels worthy to hear from God himself, but yet he wants all of us to incline our ear to him. How profound that 1,200 miles away, an autistic boy that can't communicate with his mother and father in cohesive sentences, but with grunts and groans and 
minimal communica communicative skills that God spoke through him to you as a prophet to you mm -hmm. for a season. Mm -hmm. As he did in the Bible. It wasn't forever, it was for a season. Yes. And this season has come and this season has gone and now you're chronicling this season. When you began to realize that these were not random statements, these were not random emails coming to you, that these were things that could only be revealed through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. When you came to that realization, what was that like for you? Because that was a real turning point. That was pivotal in this journey. Well, I mean, it just, it changed my life. I mean, I, I will never be the same. And so much has happened to me prophetically since that season of Josiah, it, it, it kind of launched me into a new a new season in my own life. But um, I mean, I, it just profoundly changed my life, and it humbled me. Like a lot of people think this kind of stuff makes you proud or whatever. No, it completely humbled me. I, I was on my face before God, and for for a long time I didn't share it. And I'm like, why are you why are you giving me these messages, God? Why me? Because trust me, I've got issues. I, I'm not this great guy. It's not, I, I didn't get these messages because I'm this amazing man of God. This was an act of grace. And actually, this book is a book of grace because, because we need to understand God's grace and his reality. But, you know, after I really began to search God and ask him why, one of the things I came to the conclusion was I was a writer. I write stories, and I believe God wanted this message to get out. Because, believe it or not, the book is not about me. It's about Jesus and Josiah and the Holy Spirit. And, and I'm just this kind of vessel that was used. But, but the message is Jesus is real, alive, and fully present. And one of the publicists for this book said, it's one of the few books she's ever read that was actually leading to an altar call. And, and, and that's what you, you said at the beginning. You know, the, the presentation of the gospel is at, is at the end of this book. This is a book that you give out to people, and they have an encounter with God while they're reading, and then they come to the Lord. But I want to say one thing. The reason I felt God gave it to me was he knew I was a writer, and he knew I would get the message out. And I wanted to tell you this, when I did visit Josiah in person, it just became so obvious that this was a miracle <laughs> because there was no way when you see it in person that, that Josiah or his mother could have known any of this stuff. And then the labor that they went through. But one of the things that hit me is this is a 24-7 lifestyle for, for Joe Tani and Joe and Josiah. This boy is locked up. I mean, he is he is profoundly autistic. And I mean, his mother and father, they can't even go to church together. They have to go separately because someone has to be taking care of Josiah. Well, when I got home, this really messed with me. <laughs> I mean, it messed with me for the longest time because I'm like, and this is in the book, why God? Why, how could you do this? How could you speak profoundly through this boy but yet allow him to have autism and his parents to go through this. And so I'm like, did you really speak, God? Was this really you? And that caused me to go back over the words again. And at the end, I can only conclude it's God. That There is no other explanation, but it's God. But yet he allows the boy to have autism. He didn't heal him. And so that kind of brought me to a point, you know, that just because we're going through things doesn't mean God's not present. You know, you know, just because you're dealing with cancer or, or, or COVID or I have three friends that died of COVID and they were godly men of God. One, two were pastors. So why? You ask God why? But yet he's he eternity is real. That's one of the messages of this book. <laughs> 
we're going to be with Jesus in eternity, and that is very real. That's more real than this earth right here. So anyway, <laughs> I didn't mean to get off on a tangent there. But so many people don't get messages from God, and they don't feel he's present. This book affirms you in that, that when you don't feel it, he is present. You know, I, I spent time with God today in prayer. I didn't feel a thing. Most of the time I don't feel anything. But I know by faith that he's real. And then stories like this encourage me. That, you know, because he's not always speaking like that. Most of the time he speaks through the Bible and through his promises. You know, what's so interesting about them. this is that the messages were specifically for you. And many of them were in response to prayers to yes. confirm that God heard your prayers yes. <coughs> and was sending you the answer through yes. Josiah. Well, like, the, like praying in the, in the woods. So a skeptic would say, oh, that was just an emotional experience. You just had an emotional experience. And, and I would think that sometimes. Well, you know, was that really my emotions? No, it wasn't. <laughs> Because when I got the word from Josiah, it confirmed exactly what happened in the woods that night. Jesus really was present. He really was manifesting himself. And, you know, you talk about the motels. Because I couldn't pray in my house, and I went to the, to the motel uh, on the Gulf Coast. And I found this very quaint motel. It was a motel. It was not a hotel. And, and I stayed in this quaint motel probably, you know, three times a month during that time. And basically, I locked myself in and I prayed in a motel. And, you know, I get a word from Josiah about praying in the motel. <laughs> he said motel. And, and he detailed all the steps of prayer that I did in that motel room. You know, like one, um, I, the first thing I do did when I get to the motel is I turn the TV off, I, I take the clicker, and I give it to the motel manager. And I go to my, because I'm old school, I go to YouTube, and I, and I link together praise worship songs that, you know, they go for an hour at a time. And I link these songs together, and I make a playlist on, on my YouTube and I put that in the motel room <laughs> and I let it play for hours and hours kind of creating this atmosphere the word from Josiah is um, Max likes banding his music <laughs> for sacred times in motels <laughs> and I had just gotten back from a sacred time in a motel the home the whole reason I go to the motels is for sacred times not hotels, motels and I band my music what does that mean? well, and band means linked together you know, the Bible I think band was used like 40 times and every time it meant band together Paul said a group of Jews banded together and what do I do when I go to my YouTube and link my songs together? I band those songs together. Why? For sacred times in motels. You know, and that's and then he went on to tell the rest of, of what I do uh, in the motel room. That was just one, like I said, and you know, praying in the woods. It just went on and on for twenty three different very specific words. It's, a, it's such an amazing story. It's such confirmation of the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, of how God chooses his vessels and who he can entrust. Yeah. You see, there's other people who would not have been as faithful to verify mm. as the journalist and you, to make sure that there was no hoax here, that there was nothing that was out of sorts, that you were more skeptical as a journalist, more suspicious, more probative than the average person might be. But when you began to see the pattern and were astonished at the accuracy and began the dialogue, 
you began to recognize that this was from the Lord and it was for you, not some other Max, but for this Max. Yeah. And God had to use the convincing power of a non-communicative child to pierce through the journalistic skeptic, the jauntiest eye that you had towards anything, even if you saw it for yourself, you weren't going to believe it until you investigated it completely further, even if you bore witness to it firsthand. And so knowing that he could trust you to impart this word to you, that you would do something with it. You see, part of the prophetic is really a covenant relationship with God that I'll impart a word to you, but I have to be able to trust you to one, ask me, is this for me? Is this for someone else? Am I free to release this? Mm. Am I free to share this? And when, when do you want me to share it? And when will it have its greatest impact? <clears throat> and as you chronicle in the book, COVID hit at the time that you were preparing to release. And this would be perceived as a setback, but instead it proved to be an opportunity. Mm. And only God could see the opportunity that in the natural you could not see, what bad timing it would be. I can't go to book signings, I can't go to events, I can't make personal appearances, I can't do all the things that I would normally do. Why? Because the message is so compelling on its own mm. that it doesn't need to, the way you sold your first books, you got in the car and you went knocking on doors <laughs> right? and you didn't go through bookstores. You went to gift shops. You went to uh, small towns that had a, a cottage store and yeah, sold, them, sold them the books out of the trunk of your car. Right? Uh, that's how you earned your chops in the publishing world by doing it yourself. And in fact, that's how you started with this book was mm -hmm. this was not to be published by a major publisher. This is something that was completely against your norm. You self-published it to start, used your own money, paid somebody to put it together for you. You had never done that before, and you didn't need to do that. You had an agent. You had publishers. You could have easily shopped this story, but you chose not to. But then what happened? Well, so... I didn't know what to do with the story because I had it, this incredible experience. And one day I'm shopping at Walmart, and I just I felt a nudge from the Holy Spirit that said, just just type the story up and get it out. So I typed the story up first on on just type paper and stapled it together. I mean I didn't even do a good editing job or anything, and I just gave it out to a few different people. And they just got back with me, said they wept and cried. And then I decided, because still I was fighting it because it's such an out of, box, out of the box story. I felt like, to be honest with you, I, I was worried about the religious people, to be honest with you. I was more concerned about the religious people and the publishers than I was anything else. Um, but it is thoroughly biblical. I, I let several pastors from different denominations read it. And nothing in this book is unbiblical. But, but I decided to self-publish it. And, I mean, we went through 2,000 copies in three months. And p things happened with this book that never happened with any of my others. People would buy it in bulk, you know, and give out 20 copies. I, you know, I had pastors buy it for their whole congregations. How many pastors do that? So we knew we had something really special. And then God supernaturally put me together with, with this publisher, and they just got really excited about it. So we're, we're, we're excited to see where God takes it. And really, we're excited about people coming to Jesus that, you know, through this story. If this doesn't move them, it's because they had their heart removed. Hmm that they had much more than just a bypass. They had a complete uh, artificial heart. Or sometimes that people don't want to see. 
you know, Jesus had miracles. He did miracles. It says many believed and, and many didn't believe. And when Lazarus was raised from the dead, what's so interesting about Lazarus, it says many Jews believed, but then a portion of them said, you know, we're going to have to kill Lazarus too. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes the Holy Spirit has to really break through some walls that people have built. I think in this skeptical world, we don't need more Bible studies. Mm-hmm. We don't need more devotionals. We need compelling documents that show that the Spirit of God is alive and well, and the same way he used Balaam's donkey to speak, mm-hmm. he can use an autistic child That's who right. is probably more tuned in to the divine counsel, to the unseen realm, because of the way his mind works, that he has a, the only clear path he has where there's not noise, where there's not chatter, is in the angelic realm, in the, in the heavenly realm, like, like Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the hem of his garment, the train of his garment, filled the temple, and the angels sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. I can see Josiah out of his own body in the presence of God, not imprisoned in the natural, but set free in the supernatural, where God says to him, who should I send? And Josiah says, send send me, the least likely of all of your servants, the least likely in the entire world to carry a message from the throne of grace to a journalist 1,200 miles away, that just that the utterance of your name, Max, opened up a pathway to heaven that lasted for three years. Three three and a half years. Three and a half years. Isn't that interesting that Jesus' ministry lasted three and a half years? Wow. And that's all it took. That's all it took for the message of Messiah Mm. to change the world. It's humbling. It's just incredibly humbling. And so it moved me. And I've read lots and lots and lots of books. It is an amazing story of the collision between the logical, the rational, the reasonable, and a full encounter full-body contact with the Holy Spirit and the Holy One of Israel. Mm. And you are the benefactor. You are the one God entrusted to carry this message forward. And so we are just thankful to be a part of carrying this message, of sharing this story of Jesus, Josiah and me, how my supernatural encounter with an autistic boy revealed the wonder of God's presence by best-selling author and journalist Max Davis. You can get a copy by visiting ignitinganation.com. Click on today's broadcast calendar. You'll see a statement that says, love the interview, buy the book. Click right there. We'll have a copy on its way to you. This is one of the most compelling stories I've ever read, and it lines up exactly as Scripture says it will. This is not sensational, but it's sensational. It's not sensationalism, but it's sensational. It is a manifestation of how God speaks today. If our minds are inclined to him and not entrapped in this world, and Josiah is a prisoner inside a body, but his mind is set free fully into the presence of God, hearing clearly and conveying that message articulately in prose in full sentences that are grammatically and syntax correct, things he cannot comprehend he was conveying, things he could not know he was speaking. If this can happen to Max Davis, it can happen to you. But the first step is to say yes to Jesus, to go down that narrow path to open that narrow narrow door 
and to walk through. And that mm -hmm. invitation is for you, and it's in this book. Max Davis, what a blessing it is to have you on the program, to tell this story, to share this with the world, and uh, anything we can do for you and with you, we are happy to get behind you in any way we can. Oh, you have been great. It's, it's been an honor to be here. God bless you, my I'm, friend. I'm just, I'm just incredibly moved by your words. <laughs> I'm sit, sitting here transfixed. Oh, God bless you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth. <laughs>